Welcome to Wealthy On. I'm your host, Eric Chummy. Today, we are talking to Kyle Brown. He is the CEO of Trinity Capital. They are a direct lender to growth stage companies. And Kyle, you just became the CEO on January 1st. So I know things are very busy. I know you're talking to me from the road right outside of a major conference going on right now in California. And if my reading is correct, do you have five kids and and you're also the, the brand new CEO of this company? Am I, am I getting my research right here? I do have five kids. I'm uh, I'm married to a lovely lady and have five kids. Uh, youngest is in diapers and the oldest is in college. So kind of everything in between there. I I, so I only ask because I've got baby five due any minute now, and it may come. Uh, oh, he or she may right. come between the yeah. time that we record this and we actually publish this. So oh so it's gosh. like that's it's amazing. like imminent uh, any hour now. So that's why I was curious. And I wonder, do you get any sleep? <laughs> Right, you're on the road. You're you're the brand new CEO. You've got all these kids. Are you sleeping at all? My wife wonders why I need to travel so much for work, and she says, "Why can't you just zoom it?" And I said, "Well, I, I just have to. That's how it works." And the truth is, I need to get some sleep here and there. So, and you get it at some point. You know, you don't care about sleep as much, and you're playing zone defense, so you just kind of live in the crazy, and it's it works. You know, you know, people talk about oh, zone defense, man to man, and I think about it when. The beginning of the season, you know, in those division one teams, they play the like one double A teams and the score is 70 yeah. to three. And you think, <laughs> I don't think the defense scheme was what was going to make that score any different. They're just, they're just going to lose. They're, they're outmatched no matter what the scheme is. Yeah. Well, somebody told me, I mean, every single person I talked to who is 70, 80, you know, just kind of towards the end of life, there's not a single person that's ever said, I regret having, you know, X amount of kids. I, it's always somebody saying, I wish I had more. So my wife and I believed all these people we've, we've heard say that over the years. And so we'll see. It is, it is crazy, but life's very full, which I think is a good thing. So Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. So Trinity does a lot of different things in the lending space, right? So there's, there's debt, there's a equipment financing, there's you know, direct lending. There's so many things that when we hear in the media, we always hear about, private equity, venture capital. We often hear about the equity side. We don't hear enough about the debt side, which is non-dilutive, yeah. right? If you can pay that loan back, you didn't have to give up any ownership. You've got some pretty good yeah. rates, especially when rates were a lot lower. What is your pitch to companies? And then we're going to get into more of this macro story, but what's your pitch to companies for, hey, you should be taking on you know more of a second look here on the debt side rather than continuing to raise equity? Yeah, so we, you know, it's not it's not completely uh, non dilutive. So it's uh, we, we like to say it's less dilutive. So less dilutive, okay, you know, okay. Less dilutive. So so mm -hmm. listen, if you're a company, you're raising you, you know either venture capital or private equity, and you're giving away some part of your company to do so. Um, our pitch is for for growth stage companies, and that's kind of loosely defined as for more mature companies, kind of twenty to one hundred plus percent annual growth rates who have raised significant equity dollars, who are at significant scale. Um, so these are either pre-IPO companies, uh, some are gonna be smaller uh, public companies, but they need to meet those metrics, growing rapidly, needing capital. And so what we, what, we, what we talk to companies about is just providing this less dilutive slug of senior debt um, that they have the ability to service. And they're able to get much further down the road or make acquisitions um, with the capital and, and build that valuation as they head towards that next inflection point. So, um, but all focused on growth stage companies, I, what we're building is a really diversified uh, direct lending platform focused on those types of companies. And it really is, it's across many different industries. I mean, I'm here at a healthcare conference in, in San Francisco. So we do a lot, we do some life science and healthcare and then technology. Uh, we do a lot of manufacturing equipment. So, um, but, but really we follow the money, the private equity and uh, the venture capital dollars. And, and then we come in to support those types of companies. What are you seeing right now from the macro point of view? Because you know, I'll talk to people yeah. every day and a lot of people are really concerned about the economy. They keep talking about soft landing, hard landing. Maybe we avoid a landing, right? Like what is the Fed going to do on rates? We know that equity markets are basically at all time highs, but there's this uncertainty about what's happening underneath all of it. And I think you're dealing with companies that are closer to the ground, right? Companies that are pre-IPO, they're not multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar companies. They're not necessarily all household names. They're they're fighting in the trenches right now. Are you seeing a concern 
from just even talking to your clients, you know, talking to internal, your colleagues that, hey, we're concerned about 2024 and we're not sure it's going to be as safe as the last couple of years were. Yeah, it's really industry specific, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got certain enterprise software, really anything that's got a strong AI component to it, that's receiving a lot of equity support and growing rapidly, frontier technology, uh, certain manufacturing industries are growing significantly. So it's really industry specific. Um, you know, I'd say what's obvious is that, you know, the real estate market has slowed a little bit. Mortgages have slowed. So there, I mean, there's certain industries you can point to and say, you know, that's, that's a, they're having a difficult time right now. Right. Um, I, you know, you what we're seeing in real estate, not to interrupt you, but just since you just mentioned, do you mean the commercial side or the residential side when you, when you say real estate or do you mean both? Well, both. Right. I yeah. mean, because, you know, even though we might see valuations still high on the residential side, there's really no supply. And and then you have a you have this big um, gap between what people can afford and where rates are right now and what people are making. And so at some point, there has to be some kind of correction there, whether it's rates come down, whether it's valuations come down or whether it's a combination of the two. It has to happen. Right. Um, it's not going it's not going to stay stagnant forever. So. Um, you know, I, I, the other thing we're seeing, which which is really kind of against the narrative a bit, is pretty significant volume of deals happening and volume of deals, right? Or, or uh, um, a dollar amount of deals. And so, if you so look at size like, and quantity, yeah. So yeah. if you just look at um, for, for the venture capital industry, you know, we saw there was 170 billion dollars deployed last year, and that's about the same amount that was deployed in 2020. And so we had two big years there, 21 and 22, where it was mostly larger private companies that uh, received a significant amount of capital. And then a lot of companies just raised at ridiculous valuations. But, um, you know, the, the deal volume has is, is really kind of is still at record pace taking out the last couple of years. And so there's a ton of money out there. And I, as it sits right now, just in the venture capital um, realm alone, there's a few hundred billion dollars of dry powder. And so, you know, what does that what does that what does that mean? How does that play out? I don't know exactly. But um, I guess if you're counting on um, greed and, you know, the managers can't make money unless they deploy it. Right. They, you, so uh, they're going to be sending that money back unless they can figure out a way to deploy it. And this is not too different on the private equity side as well, where you have trillions of dollars. Right. Um, of dry powder. There's just a dance happening right now uh, for private companies. And they raised valuations over the last couple of years that were um, well above what they should have. Right. And so uh, but if they need capital and they're growing and they need capital, they are going to have to take that money in. And so you're seeing lots of, you know, um, creative ways to avoid that dilutive down round, uh, which is typically comes in the form of insiders doing convertible notes. You're seeing a lot of that right now. Uh, some of the metrics I've seen have even shown that we've kind of leveled off on this valuation dip. But I don't think that's true. I think that's just hidden and disguised by these convertible notes um, and insider rounds. And so what we're seeing across our portfolio, we've got 100 plus companies, we have about 100 portfolio companies right now, is pretty dilutive down rounds, anywhere from 25 to 75% uh, valuation corrections. And, and or you might see some of these convertible notes where companies are hoping they can they can build into that valuation over time. And so there's this dance happening of dollars want to get deployed, but companies are not quite ready to take the pain. And so uh, you're going to see that play out this year. And that's, you know, I think that's that's what we're what we saw at the end of the last year and what we're going to see a lot of this year. I like what you said that your managers can't get paid unless they deploy the money. So even if they're bearish, they're not going to want to give the capital back. They're going to want to put it somewhere or you got to find some opportunity. You got to at least try to participate because if you're not participating, you're not getting paid. So I like I like your point just for people to understand that. You know, no matter what people's point of view is, especially on the institutional side, you, you have to put the money somewhere or you're out of business. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't, you know, as a, as a senior secured lender, we don't really care um, about where that valuation lands, whether it's high or low. We're sitting at a low loan to value. Um, it doesn't make a big difference. Now, where we're seeing a lot of opportunity for us is even within our own portfolio, we've been very proactive on making sure that anytime a company does a recapitalization or brings in money to lower valuation, you know, we get warrants. I think I mentioned this in the beginning. It's less dilutive. We do get warrants in a lot of these companies. And so we're being very proactive on making sure we get that lower valuation on our warrants. But on, on new deals over the last couple of quarters, it's, been a, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time right now because if you're coming in at a 25 to 75% reduction in valuation to these companies as a senior lender with warrants, 
it could provide some really interesting upside potential as these companies kind of grow and and build. And so for us, we're, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously kind of optimistic. I think there's lots of, you know, there's lots of things that have to play out this year. Um, but for the companies that get across the finish line for us, uh, that we fund, it's, you know, these are really interesting companies that might have been funded otherwise by a bank, you know, a year ago. And banks are just not, things have fundamentally changed in the banking world. So I want to get that. I'm glad you mentioned that. So we'll talk about the banks in a second. When you talk about industry specific, you mentioned real estate as one that's not doing as well. What would you say is your the industry you're most excited about? If you think about all right, 2024, you know, X, right? Is it is it healthcare? Is it manufacturing? What stands out to you as I see a lot of opportunity in the particular industry for this year? Yeah, I, the healthcare industry generally is is a great is, is I think this is a great entry point. Uh, valuations were already relatively low. Uh, they had been coming down for years. Um, you're seeing the same thing in that space with just continued uh, down rounds and uh, valuation corrections. And so the entry point's excellent there. That's a market that's clearly not going anywhere. Um, and so, you know, anywhere from, <clears throat> you know, pharma and biotech, which is really kind of the biggest part of, of that industry. And then, you know, we, healthcare services, but also uh, we focus a lot on med device and post kind of post FDA approved uh, med device. That's an interesting space for us. Um, on the tech side, you know, we're seeing, uh, we saw pretty significant value corrections on the enterprise software. And so uh, really like that space as an entry point, you know, you're getting in at five to seven times EBITDA and it used to be twice that, right? Uh, not so long ago. So uh, the entry point there I think is excellent. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, frontier tech. I kind of loosely just call it frontier tech. And uh, these are companies that are disrupting uh, old and archaic um, uh, you know, it could be travel, uh, it could be space frontier, and there's a lot of capex need there. And so, I really like. Uh, we've made a couple uh, recent investments. I don't know that we've announced it yet, so I don't. I can't share it with you. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but you'll see some really interesting investments. And, and so, those companies have a lot of capex needs, and we provide a lot of equipment financing. So, um, I'm, I'm bullish on kind of this frontier tech space, and then also just manufacturing generally. You're seeing more and more manufacturing come back to the U.S. Uh, companies are spending more on um, infrastructure. And this is something we do a lot of is cover this CapEx financing for manufacturing, testing equipment, et cetera. And so we are we're pretty bullish on the manufacturing sector. And, that you know, it's going to be industry specific, but we, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to finance a lot of that and cover a lot of that CapEx there. Is there an industry that maybe you've dealt with in the past that, you want to just stay as far away from as possible right now. Something that you're just saying, I'm telling all my analysts, telling all my VPs, I don't want to see a single deal in X. Is there something that really scares you right now? Well, the, I mean, listen, the obvious thing is the crypto. Uh, it's just such volatility. Um, you know, we, we have made some investments in equipment financing. Uh, that's, I would say, kind of around that industry. But the volatility there is just too great. Um, is for a lender, especially a lender like us, who's focused on consistent and increasing dividends uh, and wealth preservation. It's just, it's too volatile, right? Uh, maybe one day that changes, but I don't see it changing anytime soon. So that's one obvious one that's, that's really sticking out right now. And then, and then also AI, right? I and mean, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting, uh, that's a hot, that's a hot topic right now. Yeah, uh, you have companies like NVIDIA that are, um, you know, uh, I don't know what their market cap is, but you've saw two and a, you know, two and a half X growth in their stock and their, you know, uh, GPUs are a hot market or hot item right now. And, and just artificial intelligence. I mean, really there is no such thing as artificial intelligence. It's all machine learning and it's getting better and better. Um, but that's another one where you're going to see some winners, uh, probably some of the biggest winners ever, uh, but you're going to have a lot of losers in between. And that's, uh, and so that volatility, and that hit rate's just not there yet for us. Uh, one day, I think there'll be an opportunity to invest in that space, but uh, not right now. Yeah, I was, I was going to say when you mentioned crypto, you mentioned the volatility, the wealth preservation, and it, it, I started laughing. And that's exactly what is not happening in terms of if you were lending to a crypto company right now. You're getting all the volatility. You're not getting any guarantee of wealth preservation. So I can see why, you know, for your for your investors especially, it might not be the way to go. And I like what you said about AI. Yeah. We're going to see some huge winners, 
but we're going to see sure. a lot of losers. I think people forget we're going to see a lot of losers. So trying to trying to pick those might be very difficult, right? NVIDIA, fine, maybe they're going to be a winner, but now pick the next nine winners, right? Like who knows who they're going to be? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're uh, we're not in the business of making those big gambles. If we a, a deal is successful for us, we're, we're making a one point two five, you know, multiple uh, mid to high teens return. You can't have big losses uh, with that model, and so um, you will see some winners. I don't know who they're going to be, um, and I, it's not going to be anytime soon. And then going back to what you said about the banks, so all of a sudden in the last year, right? We're we're less than a year. You know, we're less than a year from when we saw those big bank failures, right? Silicon Valley Bank and everything that happened then, did that really fundamentally change your opportunity set? Did more companies come to you saying, I can't get a bank loan, I'm, I'm not getting the same love from my banker, so I need to start thinking creatively about where I'm getting my funding? Yeah, so a couple thoughts. Um, you know, if the first one is their model was, I mean, the, the, clearly the model, the banking model was broken, but their lending model was not. Uh, their book of business is strong, Silicon Valley Bank, is is still just going strong um and their lending business uh was very successful uh low losses uh, a lot of gains uh, and that really goes for bridge bank and the rest of them as well and so you know fundamentally kind of what they were doing was great and it worked very well it was needed um how they did it and having a bank who's leveraged you know eight to one right on equity um and then providing these loans to primarily cash burning companies, right? Um, it it just it it's fundamentally changed because the whole model depended on companies keeping all of their cash reserves sitting in an unsecured account, and companies aren't doing that anymore, right? Uh, they're using other instruments to diversify that risk, um, and so banks really cannot uh, perform that same function they did b before, and so you know the. And they're, and they're still going to provide receivable financing. They're still going to do a lot of the things that banks have traditionally done. And they're doing that now. Uh, I, I think all these banks would say they're all still very active. The truth is they are, but they're back to being banks um, and providing bank services where uh, the opportunity has significantly increased is for debt for these companies where it was previously provided by the bank um, and because they were lending them their own money, essentially. Now it's it's shifted to alternative lenders like us. And so deal flow starting in March of last year significantly increased and it's only continued to increase. And I don't know that that's going to change. And the truth is 10 years ago, that's how it worked. Banks did the receivable financing. We would do the debt, right? Um, or they would provide all the bank services and we would do the receivable and, and maybe some term senior term debt. And so it's kind of going back to how it used to be. And the deal flow has uh, the pipeline is is pretty robust right now, and so what's what's interesting is you see two sides of it though. We see deals that maybe um, are looking for bailout type capital, uh, which is not what we do. Uh, but then you're seeing other companies where the credit you know the credit quality is actually increased in the pipeline because they could have gotten cheap receive they could have gotten cheap capital before, and then you also have companies that that probably still could get bank debt, but they don't you know I, I just don't think companies understood that. You know they're working with a they're working with a bank who's leveraged, uh, you know eight to ten to one, right? And um, that cost of capital might be low, but it comes with lots of restrictions, and you don't know if that money's going to be there at the end of the day. And so working with a permanent capital source like us and other alternative lenders, where there can't be a run on the bank, um, really provides a lot of security for the company, and they're willing to pay 300, 400 basis points more for that capital and can afford it, and they'd rather do that uh, than work with a bank. And so you're seeing more more of that. It's interesting. I wrote down, as you said, you said the banking model is broken. Do you really believe that? Do you, and do you feel like it's it's going to unbreak at some point and come back? Or do you think this is a permanent shift? I mean, I mean you, a company would put $20 million in the bank and then the bank would lend them $20 million. I mean, at, at, at uh, you know, at SOFR. And that, that really didn't make a lot of sense before. Uh, I think it makes a lot less sense now because companies are just not going to do that. You know, they're not going to have... Uh, all their money sitting in one account at a bank. Um, and so I think it is different. I think it has changed. Uh, companies are much more, banks are, are, and they have. They also know they have regulations coming. Things are going to change, right? Um, uh, and as regulations come in, they're going to be more restricted on what they can lend out to. And, to, and so that just provides more, more opportunities for alternative lenders. How, how do you, 
when you compete, like I think people watching, let's say they know, hey, if you're trying to get a mortgage and this is in hot times, right? When everyone's trying to give you one, they'll compete and give you a better rate. You go from one bank to the next or the lender, they'll give you a better rate. How do you stay disciplined when you've got other alternative lenders out there like yourself who might say, okay, you know, you're offering, I'm making up number, you know, a 10% loan, someone else can offer nine and three quarters, someone else can offer nine and a half. And there's always that, that bidding game to get a little bit lower, a little bit lower. Where do you draw the line? Because we see a lot of these, the herd mentality, right? Whether, whether it's on the equity side or the debt side, people are chasing those obvious winners. How aggressive do you get in terms of just a, a company philosophy, a trinity, where, where you just decide, we want to be the most aggressive. We always want to win these deals or we're going to stick to our, our numerical fundamentals and, and we're okay losing deals. So we are, yeah, that's a good question. We are, we are first and foremost, a relationship lender. And so uh, we win deals, not because we're the lowest price. Generally, uh, we, we might win because it was the lowest price, but that is not the model. The model is uh, build uh, strong relationships with the sponsors. So the private equity and venture capital partners uh, get referred directly in by board members and, and run a, yes, it's going to be a competitive process. We, you want it to be competitive. Uh, you don't want to be the only one lender at the table. Um, but, we, you know, typically because we're working directly with the CEOs and CFOs referred in by one of their board members, generally, um, you have a shot at winning the business. And so the combination of having a good relationship, having a great track record, our team is a little bit different. We built our team with technology experts and then we filled it in with finance people. And so we have the ability to understand technology at a real granular level. Um, if it's a high tech deal, we'll, we'll, we'll stick one of our um, engineering partners on it so that they understand and we understand whether or not we're taking technology risk. I think there's a certain level of respect uh, a lender uh, receives and we receive by understanding these businesses at their core and understanding the technology. And so I think we win in that regard. That's a differentiator for us. Uh, and then the, the different product sets. Uh, we have the ability to finance uh, equipment. We can do term loans. Uh, we can go across different sectors. And so um, our expertise in many different industries and then having multiple products for companies ends up being a, a really interesting uh, differentiator for us. And so it, it should never be a race to the bottom. That's not our model. We lose, we'll lose deals because we won't do that. And so we've stayed really consistent over the years. I think our gross yields, we, we, we uh, I should have this in front of me, but it's still, you know, it's mid, it's mid, mid teens, 15, 16% kind of gross yields. And so it's a really healthy, you know, return that we're bringing in. Um, and then for investors, you know, that ROE is mid to high teens. And so, uh, we're generating the returns we need to, I think, that are really interesting for investors. Has there been a surprise over the past year, right? Since those bank failures, since people have been coming your direction in terms of, when I say surprise, a marketplace or an industry or a product that's really taken off for you guys that you didn't even expect would have been the case 12 months ago? Yeah. Um, so I, I think you're going to see more and more of this, but um, and it gets back to our previous conversation around private equity and the amount of dry powder that's out there right now. Uh, there's going to continue to be this year and next year, a consolidation of companies, right? As that money gets deployed, um, it's going to be private equity groups picking them up for a pretty significant discount. And so we're seeing more and more opportunities for providing that, that slug of debt alongside of that equity coming in for acquisitions and for buyouts. Um, we saw that start to tick up. I imagine that's only going to continue uh, over the next 12 plus months. And what does that what does that mean to you in terms of when you see consolidation, you see that coming, usually it means corporate layoffs, right? Oh, we don't need two accounting, two accounting departments and two marketing departments, right? We're going to start to cut costs. Is that a weakness in the startup ecosystem? Is it a weakness in, in these growth companies? Is it is it a sign of weakness generally in the economy that you're going to see consolidation or what's your perspective on, on why that trend's happening and why you think it'll continue? Like, is it strength or weakness? Well, so if you're talking about cash burning companies or venture back companies, uh, you know, they made their adjustments. Most of them made their adjustments 18 months ago. You know, what's happening right now um, with middle market and with PE back companies, this are, this happened almost, you know, 18 months ago for venture back companies right. where their investors came to them and said, you need to extend your runway. And you need to get lean and you need to do it now. And they did. You know, we saw that within our venture back portfolio. Uh, companies significantly reduced burn or just went EBITDA positive and said, we're going to grow later. And, uh, 
and we're going to control, you know, these levers, these, these, uh, these cash burn levers. And so, um, you know, on the, on the PE side and, uh, on the EBITDA positive side, you know, there, I, th- I think you've, you've seen companies start to lean up and you're going to see more of it. And certainly as a PE group comes in and looks for efficiencies, that's, that's one of the first places they're going to look. And so, um, you should see probably some more of that in the, in the coming year. When you see your experience, like the not being the CEO until this month and now you are the CEO, what, what are the things that you think about of, okay, if I were in charge, I would have done X, but now you are in yeah. charge. So you can do whatever you want. What are some changes that you want to see? What are some things that you want to do differently? Even though we know it's a father son relationship, but we know a lot of sons, they want to do a lot of things differently from their fathers. Right? So there's the, like, what's, yeah. what are you excited about that? Maybe you feel like you haven't been able to do before, but you're going to get to do it now. Well, we've, so we've, we've done a really good job of succession planning and this, uh, this is a, a release and a release that goes out, right. That says there's a title change, but, uh, in, in practice, it's been, it's been a few years. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and we've done the same thing with CFO as well. And, and we'll continue to do that. We think it's really important to, to plan, um, and plan long-term for succession planning. So, um, you know, what I'm really excited about for Trinity you know, and one of the things uh, that makes us different than our other uh, our peers out there, and certainly in the business development company space, is we're an internally managed BDC. So there is no management fee, there is no incentive fee. Uh, we're just a one balance sheet company. I have the same shares as our you know receptionist, as our institutional investors, and our retail investors. And so there's real alignment with uh, our shareholders, and I'm really focused on ROE, return on equity, um, and building a platform that can really scale that over time. And that's how we're going to set ourselves apart uh, from the other BDCs out there and the other um, uh, dividend-focused companies. We got a SEC approval uh, recently to manage an RIA. So now our public company owns an RIA and can raise private money as well, which we're out there doing. Uh, we've, we've messaged that and, and we're kind of honing in on that. So we'll now have a public company that is continuing to grow, uh, continuing to uh, improve its metrics as it gets to scale. Uh, creating new efficiencies to drive up returns on the public side. And now we're going to see um, our RIA start to generate management fees and incentive fees from the soft balance sheet capital we're raising, which will drive up our earnings per share and drive up the return for our shareholders. And so this is a platform that can really grow uh, and really scale. And for uh, our shareholders, that's something to be really excited about because we've been very consistent, 12 straight dividend increases. Um, haven't shied away from saying that is our goal uh, to continue that. And I think we've now built a platform that uh, if we can continue to see opportunities to invest and we're successful raising money off balance sheet, continue to be, that we can just, we can keep growing this thing. And so that's a really exciting, I think that's a really exciting story to tell. And I think investors are finally starting to get it and our, and our, our analysts are as well. Why did you guys set it up that way? That this, you know, you have got the same shares as the receptionist. A lot of other companies are not doing it that way. What was the, the reasoning behind it? Because- yeah. It's, it's, it's well, different, right? It is different. Um, we we struggled with this. We went back and forth on this. Um, um, this was in 2019 when we were a fund manager managing multiple funds. Uh, we sat around as an executive team and said, "What you know? What do we want to do?" And we you know we want to be the premier uh, growth stage lender in the world. And so to do that, we need access to capital. We need to we need to raise over time a lot of capital. And we looked at the market and we said, "Who trades at a premium?" And the companies that traded a premium historically are those uh, that are internally managed that have the structure we have. Um, it might have been uh, a little more profitable for myself and our management team had we set up a management company and raised capital. But would that have been in the short term? We're trying to, I mean, we're, we have a 10 year goal. I have a longer goal uh, um, in terms of timeline. And so we're looking way out in the future. We want to build something that's lasting and long uh, and lives a long time. And we think this is the structure to do that. Um, we And it's proven out over the last four years as we've traded a premium to NAV. We have access to the capital markets. We na- we've, we've been able to do exactly what we told investors we're going to do. And we've been rewarded with additional capital. And so that's why we did it. I think in the long term, it's going to serve myself and our management team and our executives and our employees really well um, as, we, as our shareholders benefit. And so we set it up that way so incentives would be aligned. And uh, I, think every, I think it works for everybody. When we think about, you know, here at the beginning of 24, all this debate on interest rates, right? What is the Fed going to do? Jerome Powell, are they cutting? How much are they going to cut? Are we at the top of the market on, on, that, on that curve there? 
twos, tens, inversions, all of those things. What's your perspective on it? How much does it even impact your business? I mean, you're doing a lot of fixed rate, a lot of floating rate. What's what's your view just generally on that whole macro you know, Fed talk that we always see front page of the newspaper, right? But yeah. but I'm not sure how much of it truly impacts your business and then the businesses that you serve. So I'll start with uh, how it impacts us. Uh, we saw we saw benefits. Our rates are floating to our borrowers, uh, and then our corporate debt is uh, is half of it's fixed. We're really more than half it's fixed, and so. So you're borrowing it fixed, but you're lending it floating. So we saw, yeah, and we, you know, we fixed a lot of capital in when rates were very low. And so for us, yeah. it's been a big boom, right? It's been yeah. a benefit uh, primarily. And so the one thing we did, which I think is going to separate us from our peers here as rates go down, is we we actually set pretty pretty high floors on all of our deals. And so I think our average floor is it's oh it's double digits. And so well over double digits. And so there's a scenario here where rates either stay flat or go down and we'll see our cost of capital go down, but our our uh, loans won't. And so there'll be another little benefit there if rates trickle down a bit for us. The, the, other, the other thought though is it doesn't significantly impact our companies. I mean, if rates continued to go up, it would, it absolutely would, but we sit at a pretty low loan to value. Generally, I think we average 15 to 20%. Uh, across the portfolio loan to enterprise value or last 409 valuation. So, you know, the incremental cost that we saw over the last couple of years, it, it, it was a pain point for companies, but it, it's not like a middle market company where it's significantly leveraged and this is going to push them to the brink of, you know, failure. Uh, that doesn't exist. And so rate decreases will be good for them, but it won't really significantly impact them as well. Might for the, for the cash burning company, for the venture back companies, it might provide more runway. Um, and then for the later stage companies, uh, it'll just provide more cash on the balance sheet and, and beef up their balance sheet a little bit. It feels like so much of the news flow is all about these high flyers, right? When you, you open up that front page of the Wall Street Journal, it's all about the cash burning startups, right? They don't give enough attention to what's happening on the lending side or what's happening with the middle market companies, the ones that they're not as rate sensitive, right? We keep hearing the stories of, oh, if they move rates by one or 2%, all these companies are gonna go out of business, but but you're playing in a space where that's not necessarily true. So what I'm wondering is, what is it that what, what you read or you see on the internet or social media, like things that you see in the media that that you find are are myths or they're, they're not true in your experience? Do you find that you're running into certain themes or stories that you just feel like you're having to explain a different story to others when you're having a conversation? Well, yeah. So, you know, I think the venture capital market is, is one myth that, you know, that it has been steadily increasing um, gradually since 2000. Right. And I think just, you know, it's, it's a mature and stable market and there is a significant amount of capital, but our country really depends on it. And I, I think technology is a good place to invest. And I think it's a good place to invest into the future. And so regardless of, you know, what market cycle we're in, uh, there will continue to be investments in technology companies uh, just generally. And so, um, and even, you know, even coming out of 2000, there was a significant amount of investment uh, after that crash, right? And so those are some of the most successful funds, right? And so, you know, we saw, we've seen a pretty significant decrease in valuation across the board, a crash, uh, you're going to see some of the most successful funds and investments come out of this time. And uh, where companies or where investors are getting in at the right valuation. So I think a lot of people are going to be judged, certainly, by the investments they make over the next 12 or 24 months. And you're going to see a pretty, you know, you're going to see some re really interesting outcomes in the future. And so uh, that's, you know, I'd say that's one, that's one kind of myth. Um, and then most of the companies that we focus on, these growth stage companies, they have a lot more levers in place to control spend. And so, um, and, and many have turned towards profitability and they have the ability to do that. That's one of the things we underwrite too, is do they have the ability to turn the corner and use these different levers to get to profitability and pay us off if they need to. And, and that's something we focus, we focus in on. What, what's an example of a lever that a company, some companies might have, but others might not. Well, I mean, the easiest thing is just, if you're spending to grow and the market's just not absorbing it, you can just turn that off. Right. And so you can you can slow your spend, you can slow marketing and sales, hiring. Most of the companies, when we provide capital, it's going directly into hiring and marketing to sell a, a product that has found its product market fit and it's really scaling now. And so we're just gasoline for the fire. And so uh, you can always dial that back pretty quick. And then, you know, before we go, it's just funny to think about 
you're talking about manufacturing investments and staying away from AI, which is so, so anti the hype, right? Everyone's like, oh, manufacturing. Well, we know it's coming back here in the States for a lot of reasons, but AI this, AI yeah. that, software. But it's interesting to talk to somebody who's saying, I'm trying to stay away from that because it's a little too volatile. It's a little too crazy. And I, and I see a growth opportunity on the manufacturing side, which has traditionally been less of a front page story. Yeah. I mean, if you look at our portfolio, you, you dig in the site a little bit, it looks very sexy. We, we, we're financing some really interesting companies. Um, but our secret sauce is that we have figured out how to uh, take the venture risk out of, uh, out of venture debt and, uh, and, and remove that risk element. Uh, with a 22 basis point loss rate going back to 2008, we've proven that out. And so we get into companies that have a moat around their technology, a moat around, you know, a couple year head start on their competition, significant institutional dollars that they've raised, and a real product market fit where they're scaling and growing. And we're just coming in to help them get to that IPO or that M&A or whatever it is. And so we have figured out something there, uh, and I think we do it really well. But we're looking for singles and doubles, uh, and whether they whether this company becomes Google um, or doesn't quite make it, and we have to help them get across the finish line, it doesn't matter. We're just looking for that team's return in the in 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 the meantime. Did you say only a twenty two basis point loss? Was that right? Twenty two annual basis point loss is our historic average. So you're getting ninety nine point eight percent back then. We are, yeah, we sure are. Um, a lot of that comes into um, you know, we, we do see some pretty significant upside in our warrants. I mean, there are years where those warrants, I mean, one of our biggest warrant hits was last year, uh, Lucid Motors. We did a loan back when they were battery technology. Yep. Uh, they went public, as you know, through a decent bag. And uh, that was a 50 plus million dollar realized gain on a, on a relatively small loan amount. Um, our warrants have historically covered our losses and then provided our investors with some interesting upside in different cycles. And so um, the, the, if you were to factor in all of our realized gains, we would have a negative loss rate. And so um, that's, how we th that's how we think about our world is our loans end up being what they are. They are rate and fees, current pay, monthly payments, and we distribute out you know, quarterly to our investors. And then our big hits uh, cover some of our losses and then provide a little extra upside. Very cool. And then just before we go, just give us a book that you would recommend people read, you know, just a different perspective on understanding your world a little bit better or, or someone that you aspire to be more like, what's a, what's a book that you would recommend for us? Well, I, so I just finished uh, JP Morgan's uh, house of Morgan and, you know, it's a, it's a history of, of really our country and, and finance in our country. And the thing that really strikes me is that history just repeats itself. I mean, we, we are the things we're talking about now are things that were being talked about years ago, decades ago, 100 years ago. And so I think there's a lot to, to glean from from uh, studying history like that. I do. I certainly do a lot of it. But that's what I just finished. So it's front of mind. And uh, and I, I do spend a lot of time fundraising. I'm in New York. I'm in Rockefeller Center pretty often. So uh, I did. I did enjoy it. And I think it's I think it's worth understanding where you came from. Kyle, I appreciate the time. Very interesting conversation and into what's happening on your side of things, the industries you're looking at, the ones you're staying away from, and, and how the, the lending model has changed, especially over the last 12 months. So Kyle, thank you so much for the time today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks again to my guest, Kyle Brown, CEO of Trinity Capital. Very interesting conversation, real eye-opening on what's happening on the, the debt side of things. It's not, all, it's not always about private equity and venture capital, right? There's a whole other world out there. And of course, look, if you're thinking about trying to figure this out for yourself, your family's investments, your own personal future and all that, you can go to Wealthion.com. Got a short form there. If you want to connect to an investment professional that, that we endorse, that we vetted, it's a short form. You can just fill that out, put your email address in, we can connect you. There's no fee. There's no cost. There's no obligation. There's no commitment. You can just have a conversation, see if that person is right for you. And of course, check out the Anthony Scaramucci show. That's every Friday. It's live 11 a.m. Eastern. You can call in. You can submit your questions also at wealthyon.com and he'll be talking to whoever wants to call in. So that's again, live Fridays at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thanks again for watching and listening. Of course, if you liked the episode, you actually like it on YouTube and on your podcast app and share it and forward it and subscribe and do all of those things because that helps the computer algorithms get it out to more people so even more can enjoy and listen and learn. Thank you so much for watching and listening. I'm Eric Chummy. We'll see you next time.